Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Tom from Data Protection World Forum, and the topic for today's webinar is Privacy Leadership Demands More Than Minimum Compliance. And presenting today's webinar is Justin Anton Ippelai, who is founder and CEO of Wirewheel, and Steve Wright, who is partner at Privacy Culture. I'd like to hand over to Justin to introduce himself a little more. Tom, thanks so much. And I hope this uh, webinar finds everybody doing well at this uh, difficult time for folks all around the world. Um, my name is Justin Antoni Pillay, and I'm the CEO at Wirewheel. Uh, before I started Wirewheel with a phenomenal team, uh, I served uh, as an undersecretary uh, at the US Commerce Department under President Obama and I finished that stint in 2017. Um, I'm really excited about today's discussion uh, and uh, really delighted to be joined by a, a real leading expert in the privacy and data protection field, uh, Steve Wright from Privacy Culture. Uh, Steve, welcome uh, to our uh, webinar today and I'll turn it over to you for a quick introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Justin, and uh, you very kind words um, from you uh, there. Uh, um, so uh, good afternoon, everybody, and good morning um, to my colleagues in, in the US. Um, my background is uh, the last 25 years in data, really, specifically in data security, and then the latter part of my career in data privacy. And I've had the honor and pleasure of um, being a CPO for Unilever um, and uh, for a large retailer here in the UK and, and, and then a short stint at the Bank of England. But now I'm a partner at Privacy Culture and I'm absolutely excited um, to hear from Justin and uh, on his tool and the, the topic for today. It should be really exciting. Um, I think these webinars are a great way for all of us to continue to learn and understand. And there's not a day that doesn't go by where I don't learn something new, which is what makes this industry so exciting and fun to be in. Um, but yes, also just in recognizing that we are in pretty interesting and dark times at the moment. And um, so this is, this is a welcome relief. And uh, back to you, sir. Well, you know, Steve, I, I I couldn't agree more. I mean, we're we Wirewheel are based here in Washington D.C., and honestly, it's been a tough time. It's been a tough time for our whole team, for our customers. Yeah. Um, we have some really valued partners on the you know on the retail side, on the hospitality side. You know, Steve, I know you. You know, you led a privacy organization at John Lewis. Mm -hmm. You understand, yeah. you know, the pain that so many of our customers are going through. And what what you and I have been really talking about today is how can we support and talk to our community when both of us have seen some really challenging mm -hmm. times. We're watching um, the privacy community, which is almost always. Um, deal with a small budget, a small yeah. team, and yeah. huge responsibility. Yes. Um, you know, having to bear even more responsibility at this tough time, having yeah. team members you know, who are often working under tough conditions, it's very, it's very challenging, honestly, to do a lot of the work that our community does when you have not, you know, not the ability to, to speak to folks and actually make that human connection in the way that you normally did. And, yeah. um, and and even in these challenging times, how many articles, I mean, you cannot turn on the news without seeing that because privacy is a fundamental right, that even now we're watching company after company who's having to deal with a smaller budget and do things more leanly, um, still be held accountable where yeah. uh, privacy comes to bear, you know? Uh, so, I mean, uh, I know I know that's an important thing for you and I. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, and, you know, I, I've, you know, like, like many of um, the 
data protection officers and chief privacy officers around the world, um, I like them follow the enforcement actions that are happening around the world, looking um, at kind of the root cause and, and, and then sort of somewhat hoping that that never happens to us. Um, and certainly, the, you know, the clients that I support and look after now, um, it, it, it is, as you say, a lot to do with um, now thinking about how how to really operationalize and embed, um, but also at the same time sort of demonstrate value and 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 efficiency. And I think the key word that I, I would say for for any DPO CPO is going to be innovation, um, because we are we are facing you know these are unprecedented times, and we we're really having to you know work differently and behave differently. And, and, you know, the, the new norm is, is very different from what it was even a month ago. And that's what's staggering about this, this pandemic is the, the, the rate of change. Um, you know, everybody's working from home now. And that was fine on, on the odd occasion. But suddenly we're, we're, we find ourselves situating where, like you say, you're trying to manage teams uh, communication via via this medium and and, and others, and it, and it really is hard, and it and it makes it dreadfully difficult. And and the worst bit about that, and and incidentally, I did some training, some virtual classroom training, um, just the last couple of weeks for for one of my clients. And you know, the 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 risk, the level of risk has gone up significantly. Uh, with people working from home, connecting to unsecured Wi-Fi routers, et cetera. And yet, you know, we, we were unprepared. <laughs> so, so yeah, that is a great, great point. And, um, and I thought, roll, you know, running up to, um, <laughs> I'll just, last point, I, I thought running up to GDPR implementation when I was at John Lewis was stressful. Um, I, I, and I, I, relieve my stress by going running every morning which which helps me um but but i thought that was stressful but this is this is unprecedented so i really do have a lot of empathy um for my colleagues who are in situ in in you know full-time cpo dpo positions yeah no i I'm, we're in the same boat and honestly yeah. we've had major retail you know we have major retail uh clients customers of ours who use our mm -hmm. platform and we're trying to do as much as we can to support the community. Um, and I know our, our, those attending today, and we have a phenomenal group of really experienced um, privacy folks. So I think uh, Steve and I had talked about an agenda, knowing that we were going to have PhD level uh, colleagues joining us today <laughs> of trying to focus on what's meaningful um, to this community. And so, um, the, the topic that we're covering today is really about how privacy leadership at this time is a human driven world. It really is. Your companies are turning to you for judgment calls day to day, and it really mm -hmm. is judgment calls. And coming to the forefront in the privacy leadership world are a series of them, and we're going to try to cover some meaningful topics that balance some challenges we're seeing across the spectrum. And some of those challenges include the following. You need to still be able to make that human judgment at the end of the day that you are doing the right thing with your customer's data for what you've taken it for. That is a human being driven judgment and we see that day to day, number one. Number two, Steve and I are going to talk about, as a practical matter, uh, the, uh, the judgments that become harder in order to actually decide, you know, when you're going to bring the full DPIA analysis to bear, for example. You know, these decisions that all of us are having to make about when you go deeper and when you don't, they put a lot of they put a lot of stress on our community, really. And Stephen, who's done this day-to-day -day and has implementing this and has built an entire um, company around being able to help companies make that judgment, because the truth is when you're having to do more with less, you can't go conduct 
full assessments on everything. You can't go to the, you know, to the bottom of every well because there's just not enough time. So you have to make some judgments. And Steve, I think you'll have some phenomenal insights for our community about just how to think about that. Yeah. And from, from the technology and implementation side, um, we are going to talk a little bit today about how to think about bringing technology in the right way for your risk profile. In other words, our goal at Wirewheel is not to just, for example, implement every technology for all purposes. It's to bring the right kind of solution to help you mitigate the specific risks. And the reason I'm smiling now is a lot of the discussion that Stephen and I have had, and I'm sure even looking at the attendees today that comes to bear every day is on the technology side for privacy we see the following come up all the time and our company pushes back on it day to day. We don't believe you can automate the human beings out of the privacy world. There are too many judgments that we own that your companies rely on and that the idea that you're gonna bring AI to take away the DPOs and privacy professionals, we just don't see it. We just don't see it. Um, number two, we don't really you know, view there to be some magical technology that you plug in and you're going to have bots you know, going all over your ecosystem and then privacy is solved. And so a lot of what we are going to be tackling today is with the idea of um, if it's not bots and it's not AI, what are the right kind of technologies you can bring to bear and how do you ask the right questions so that you're testing the technology to match your particular needs? And all of this is going to come back to the, to the core topic we're covering today, which is privacy leadership means that you have to take risk that we often as a community are assuming a fair amount of responsibility. And our companies at this tough time, especially with everything going on, are probably going to be turning to us more to do more with less this year than in other times. Mm -hmm. um, so we're gonna cover some topics today, I, you know, just by way of, of framing. Mm -hmm. By the way, I, I can't tell from an audience view, and I know this is a little awkward to, to break the, uh, the stage here, Tom, but can you see the slides that we're presenting as we go? I can see in the audience view, I just can't see if they're actually being presented. Or or can you tell, Steve? We do uh, have- Hi, Justin, there, sorry. I yeah. had to unmute mute myself. The audience will be able to see the slides, yeah, confirm. When I look at the audience view, I'm not actually seeing the slides though, Tom, um, so which is why audience, I was at. The audience view is just their media player. They'll also have a slide widget and they'll have a Q&A widget that will be separate to this. So their view is similar to the presenter view. Okay, terrific. So right now you can see a slide that talks about the offerings on Wirewheel, Tom, for example. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. Okay. So part of our platform, uh, I really appreciate those audience members that are chiming in. Now we can jump in. So really, you know, from the from the technology side, we help companies with all of the management of your customer privacy needs. That means notice and policy management and presenting a trust center, those critical exercises around data subject rights uh, automation, taking an access portability correction, and how do you bring the right approach to that uh, in California, there is a lot of focus on a particular subject right, which is uh, do not sell. And how, how does that become a meaningful thing uh, now around the world? So we'll cover that today. And then, of course, uh, we have offerings under assessment automation and data discovery, um, you know, vendor assessments and the creation of ROPAs or Article 30 type of automation. We're gonna cover this, not that we're gonna go through our offerings, but in being able to talk about how do you tie together some of your technologies in the right way to solve some of these problems today. So 
Um, with that brief introduction, um, what we what we're going to start with, and and really Steve and I are going to start with a conversation, mm. um, but it's going to start with these first couple of questions, which is. Why does an organization start with the concept of minimal compliance? And um, we hear that all the time, and it almost comes across in a pejorative way. Hey, we're only trying to be minimally compliant. But, but there, is, there is a real value to starting with minimal compliance. And Steve, I think what, what that means to me is, you're making sure you at least have the basic systems and processes in place that your organization understands that privacy is a critical, um, you know, um, important issue and that your team members know where to come to look for most of their major offerings that you're actually understanding what kind of data you're collecting and what you're doing with it. Right, there has to be some basic starting point. So I actually don't look at minimal compliance as a as a pejorative thing. I I look at it that you have to start somewhere. You have to look at your resources, and you have to make sure that for your basic offerings, that you have at least done, you know, and you feel comfortable in your gut that you're doing the right thing with your customer data, um, and that's that is a critical place to start. Don't you think, Steve? Absolutely. And um, I'll just add to that, um, that, you know, certainly if I take the case of John Lewis, um, you know, the, the first port of call for me was um, making sure that the board individually, uh, like the HR chief HR officer, the financial officer, um, the marketing director had and understood their responsibilities and, uh, in terms of um, privacy or, or data protection. So, so that, for me, was, was the sort of single first port that, that I, I travelled towards when, when I arrived at John Lewis. That um, investment of, of time and uh, helping them to understand the responsibilities that they had really paid absolute dividends in the end because you know, not only did I have somebody to escalate up to when difficult decisions around um, you know, certain things we were doing, data analytics, for example, um, some AI that we were looking to use, um, the, those difficult decisions, I could take them straight up to board level directors um, and, and get them to understand that as part of their responsibilities uh, under GDPR, that you know they were able to inform and lead from the front. So that was the first thing for me when it came to compliance. The 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 next step was then how to sort of disseminate that those roles and responsibilities throughout the organisation. So starting at the top and working all the way down to shop floor workers to lorry drivers. How how do they how did they feel about um, personal data about privacy or PII? So so for me that was the sort of first start before I then started to look at okay what have we got where have we got it and what technologies can we introduce to help us do the analysis and then maintain that. No, look, uh, Steve, that's a great place to start, right? That cultural beginning is critical for for mm. your companies. But let, let let me make sure, um, just so that we get all of our our you know viewers as well on the same page. What do we mean by minimal compliance? And there are a lot of ways to run a privacy program. There really mm. are, and a lot of the ways we work with our companies is you know this is a really when you compare it to cybersecurity, the privacy world is still early. So when we come in, a lot of a lot of it you could you could have a 200 page manual on how to run your privacy program. And you can have it, we've seen companies have it on a single page. So yeah. maybe I could maybe I could um, go through how we stand up privacy programs just so you and I are using the same language with our viewers today. 
But I'm going to I'm going to frame this with one very hard question to you, Steve, as I cover this for you to think about. When you're one of the hardest things we've seen in a privacy program at various points is setting up a CPO or a DPO for a very hard decision. Where do you stop? Where do you stop? Where can you make a judgment that you've conducted enough of an inventory that you can start assessing the systems? Where have you done a lightweight inventory assessment or a high risk assessment that you can make a judgment that you don't need to go deeper. And in this time, this is a very, very tough time. As I mentioned, if you go to the bottom of every well on every single system, you will never be able to stand up a privacy program. So I'm gonna come back to you, Steve, with that question. But when we're standing up a privacy program, just to use the same language, we often are enabling a company to start with a data inventory. and that is going to your major operational units, having them get a sense, not everything, we're not trying to get everything, get a sense of the major business processes and systems. So you have a basic inventory and do a lightweight look at each of those business processes and systems to get a sense of what is the data how are you using it? Is it secure? Do you have a retention policy? Just the highest level. And an example of a business process or system might be your CRM, or it might be you might define your business process as your entire HR process, right? So companies do it in different ways. But we almost always are starting with a data inventory. Out of a data inventory, we're trying to identify obvious places where you have gaps or where you need to remediate number one because you don't want to have your you don't want to have a known obvious red flag so you want to be able to identify those places where there's something really obvious you usually want to if you're covered by gdpr be able to identify a place where you need to do a formal high risk assessment they call it and the high risk assessment is meant to drive a decision about whether you need to do a very deep dive on a DPIA, right? So initial data inventory allows you to remediate, allows you to conduct high risk assessments to determine whether to do a DPIA. And then sometimes you might do a, a PIA, although those are usually not a legally required item. And then where all of our companies are usually trying to get to, Steve, by the way, you can you can push back if any of this is not consistent. <laughs> but where we're trying to get, we're trying to get to a state where privacy becomes part of the design of your applications, privacy by design. And yeah. the goal there is there's nothing worse than, and it's it's happening to all of us every day, they're getting pulled in to a situation at the very last minute, as opposed to being called in early to being uh, part of the process. So mm -hmm. we run from inventories to high risk assessments to PIAs and DPIAs run remediations, all with a goal of getting our companies onto a path to be able to do, do privacy by design as quickly as we can. Anyway, does that, does that uh, rough framework match how you think about it, Steve? Absolutely. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm just going to give you three examples um, where, um, first of all, I, I won't mention any company names, but there, one organization um, uh, where I've recently worked was the threshold for what you're talking about, the threshold for um, data privacy impact assessment was set so high, um, or so you know, so low, if you like, um, that in effect it was running hot. So lots of data privacy impact assessments were coming through. So what I said was, well, look, you, you've got this set too low, and and obviously it should be the eighty twenty rule. So your privacy teams, your privacy council should should only be intervening on twenty percent of the amount of activities. The other 80% should be business as usual, it should be embedded, it should be part of your change control, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, for, for those, you might only want to um, 
have an intervention sort of once a year where you go and do an audit or you get your third line to go and audit that. The, the other example is going back to your inventory point where um, when I arrived at John Lewis, I uh, discovered that um, when I asked the, the e-commerce director, you know, I was trying to understand the user journeys. And I said, well, well where do you capture data? What, what, what channels do you capture data? And they said, well, we have about six different ways that we capture the PII, the, the personal data. And I said, that's great. Can I, can I look at those? And I looked at those and I, and I thought, well, I took, I got the team and we, we looked further and it ended up that there were 21 different ways that we captured data. So, so the point there, Justin, is, is not always does your business understand where it's capturing data. So whilst you would do, as you quite rightly said, um, a risk-based um, an analysis of all of the data sort of that you know about, if you like, um, to, to try and focus on, on, on the top most sort of sensitive ones and, and the most risky ones, if you like, um, there is still an element of um, data discovery or, or just plain walking through the user journey that helps you to understand just the amount of, you know, the amount of times that that data and opportunities that data can be captured, whether that's coming in via your contact center or feedback forms or surveys, it doesn't matter, uh, both from HR perspective as, as, you know, as well as your customer data, as you quite rightly said. Um, and I think the, the danger with all of this is that, um, which, which is kind of what you're alluding to, is in my experience, we often overcomplicate it. We, we make it too hard. And this goes back to the sort of behaviors and the educational piece. That's why it's so, that's why we are Prigsy Culture, because we believe it starts with the culture of the organization. And, um, and, and, and you can only do that, it takes time, but you can only change that culture by changing behaviors, by empowering people and, and getting people to feel and take local ownership, whether that's in country, whether that's in a division or a department, et cetera. So, so for me, the inventory, as you quite rightly said, you know, under the records of processing, um, Article 30, that, that's a prerequisite under CCPA um, for customer data. That's a prerequisite. You need to know. Um, so, so if you like, there, there's a natural um, uh, selection process that takes on, but sometimes that's down to the judgment of the DPO CPO. Yeah, look, I, Steve, I couldn't agree with you more. And we did get a question, which I think is worth focusing on one turn. And, you know, as, as always, these the time is going to end up flying by. So the, the, the question we had is, um, as a general matter for when you're doing a data inventory, the question was, well, don't I have to run a DPIA for every processing activity? And the answer is no, really. Even under GDPR and certainly true under U.S. practice, this becomes a very important part of how you can start to bring the right resource to the right risk profile. So on Wirewheel, for example, when you, you can configure your initial inventory, we can we set it up in our, in our automation system. A, a good example of what I'm talking about here is, let's say you have a question, and this is standard in our templates, that says, do you have a retention policy? Do you have something where you're getting rid of the data when you no longer need it? Are your people trained to handle sensitive data, right? If the, if the answer is no, you have a red flag, right? If you're handling personal information and our system can alert you, hey, this is something you need to look at. That's remediation. Uh, if you're handling European information and personal information, that doesn't mean you need to do a DPIA. It means you need to run it through a, a high risk analysis, which is often lightweight. Look at the answers and then make a human judgment. Do I need to do a DPIA? Yeah. And you can bring some automation to this, right? So that you have the right information. <clears throat> but this is a critical human judgment call that this community can do a lot for your companies by doing a sensitivity analysis exactly as Steve identified. Don't you think, Steve? Uh, I couldn't agree more. I think this is, 
often with the you know with with the GDPR and the recitals um, and you know the fantastic um, insights and and um, put guidelines that come out of our data protection uh, authorities um, in country and, and the European one. Um, the, 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 the trouble is a lot of this doesn't take into consideration um, your business or, your, or, or the circumstances of which you're collecting the data or, or, or handling the data. And, and only you, could, only you as, a, as a DPO or CPO would know that or your teams would know that. And, and so you're right, it, it is a judgment call. Um, the, 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 the key, I think, here is about um, really understanding the risk. And I, I was working on a client last year, last summer, um, and they had d deployed huge amounts of um, technology, uh, including like uh, DLP type technology. And I asked them, what, why, why were you doing this? What was the specific risk that you were running? And, and they, you know, they, didn't, they couldn't articulate that. They couldn't answer those fundamental questions of, uh, you know, is it proportionate? What's the risk? And, and have we got a proportionate control or response to that? And I think this also goes back um, to the, the, you know, the principles of what we're trying to do here to, to, to sort of um, protect and safeguard the rights and freedoms of individuals. Um, and it's, it's applying that, you know, this is the kind of work that I do with my um, clients. It's, it's just applying that experience and that logic to be able to say, well, okay, that, that is going to require, um, you really need to understand the level of risk and the impact to the individual for that um, particular activity, what you're looking to do. And it, and it calls into questions, you know, question about data ethics. And, and, you know, obviously the lawful basis by which you're processing it in the first place and all these other good questions that you should be asking yourself or your teams should be asking the business. But understanding what the business wants to do with the data, that's got to be the key. You know, it's, it's straightforward when it comes to employee data, HR data, you know, they, they need it to do X, Y and Z uh, for payroll, for benefits, etc. Um, but you can you can over engineer this is is my advice so be careful keep it simple keep it straightforward and you know capture that in in a f formal methodology uh is also a, a good way to go yeah steve i couldn't agree more so let let me wrap up this slide because believe it or not this is slide five of 21 <laughs> right? I wonder where you were. <laughs> when i are not going to make it through so let me let me let me put a little bit of a bow on this one. So when we're talking assessment, managing your privacy program office, there's two things Steve and I want to bring to, to sort of bring to bear. One, when you're looking to automate your assessments, your data discovery, and creating that privacy documentation, the inventory, Article 30 inventory, creating a high risk assessment, a DPIA and then later privacy by design, right? These are critical documents that you start wanting to have in your files. Look for a technology platform that allows you to build the business process the way you wanna do it, so you're not asking questions that are irrelevant. Look for a technology platform that will start surfacing critical insights, let you prioritize the places you need to go deeper. But at the end of the day, probably the most important thing that will allow you to bring the right uh, approach are have leadership like the folks on this call make a judgment about where you draw the line so that your team is not overwhelmed by having to do the deepest dive on every system. And yeah. um, we had, we had a fair amount that we were gonna cover, I think today on CCPA, but rather than go deep on it, because GDPR has been a huge amount of work and continues to be driving a lot for our companies. I thought, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of work with companies who are tackling CCPA, um, Stephen, and, and the work is very analogous to what's happened with GDPR. Mm. Um, but I would, I, I, we thought we'd highlight just a few things that are a little bit different, you know, from the CCPA perspective for the folks on the phone when we're watching implementation. The first is 
Um, in CCPA, unfortunately, it's gone even more, uh, even backwards from the way GDPR was implemented in the sense that CCPA legally went into effect in January, but the regulations that show you what you're supposed to do, even today, four months in, are not final. And to be honest, this is an incredibly unfair thing to the whole community. We have companies that have built out processes, tried to do their best, and are having to pivot their um, subject rights automation, for example, every couple of weeks with new versions of the regulations. I, I'm, I'm not trying to you know, cast shade on the regulators because they're trying to develop it as quickly as they can. But just the way the law was written has put an enormous amount of pressure, I think, unfairly on a lot of folks on this call. You know, And I think the final regulations are due any day now, uh, but, um, but it's cost the community quite a bit. Um, the second major thing that we'd highlight, and then you know, I'll, I, I, I'm happy to have you jump in here too, Steve, is because there's no specific requirement for a PIA or a DPIA or an Article 30 kind of register in CCPA, the focus for CCPA implementation has really been around setting up systems and processes to fulfill access requests, deletion requests, and mm -hmm. do not sell requests. And we have, we have a full system that's used by huge companies to take a request, do validation of who you are, you know, through various means, collect the data and deliver it back. But that has been a real challenge for companies because a lot of the companies that have to um, tackle this are honestly B2B companies that didn't have to have a whole lot of consumer interaction before. And so we're seeing a lot of time spent on that program uh, build out. Um, while we're not going to go deep into the CCPA side of things, I guess I'd make only a couple of quick points before we come back to what this will mean to this community. Um, the real focus for CCPA compliance has been access, deletion, and then you know, enabling a company to understand whether their customers want their data to be sold or resold. But what we've been seeing when you implement is that the cost of trying to fulfill an access request in the US with our companies has been pretty high when you're doing it manually, when you're trying to go around your organization to collect the data. And we, we obviously are assisting companies with GDPR implementations and CCP implementations, Steve, and you and yeah. I talked about this. But one of the biggest things we've seen that is a difference, and I, I'm not exactly sure why, maybe I'll ask you this. A lot of the DSAR work under GDPR has been for around employee data. And a lot of the requests that we're seeing under CCPA is from consumers or you know the actual customers. Have mm -hmm. you seen something similar in your practice, Steve? Well, uh, yes, and um, as, as, as you know, we, we just recently developed some masterclasses for CCPA um, <clears throat> for an international client. And, you know, the, the, uh, what's interesting about this and, um, is I've never, um, I've never implemented CCPA, so um, I'm talking from a uh, academic perspective, <laughs> um, but I have got plenty of um, war stories and scars on, on GDPR. The the key, what appears to be the key, you know, difference, and I'm stating the obvious here, is that obviously, you know, the, Cal the California regulation was very centered around the consumer and protecting the rights of that consumer to give them choice, essentially. Um, whereas naturally h here in Europe, um, we the whole emphasis was um, well. It started actually in, in kind of tr trying to create a level playing field in in the digital space um, to, to to you know to promote competition and and to give back some of those rights to the individuals. And it it you know it didn't differentiate between 
uh, the employee and the consumer. In fact, it, it actually sees it as the same thing because naturally you are, you can be both. Um, so what, in my experience, and certainly with the clients that I support at the moment, um, it's it's often the and, and I think this is this might be a historical reason, but um, certainly for some of my French and German colleagues, um, is it, um, there's there's a very strong, um, if you like, s- sort of social um, kind of perspective on this, where 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 the where unions have a strong presence in certain industry sectors, stronger in others. And that prevails in the, if you like, in the attitudes of some of those employees feeling as if it's their, you know, it's it's their right to have this information. And so, so what we've seen and what I've seen um, across Europe is that um, there is a, a sort of half and half of between employee DSARs and consumer DSARs. Now, interestingly, on the uh, so the employee ones tend to be. Um, uh, you know, someone, someone agreed, someone being let go, you know, laid off, and, and, and you'll naturally see a spike in that if you're, if you're having redundancies, for example. Um, but the other side, on the consumer side, seems to be much more driven by customers who um, were aggrieved or, you know, fed up with receiving the same marketing message, having opted out or thought that they had come out of the CRM system, you know, uh, um, phoned the call centre, reassured that they were being, you know, forgotten, if you like. And then six weeks later, sure enough, they get a bit of unsolicited email offering them um, a new TV, having just bought one. So, so you know, it, it sort of comes from those perspectives. So a lot of those DSAR requests are... Uh, and certainly on my analysis of them, when you look into them, were um, fundamentally complaints uh, and, 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 and basically annoyed consumers that, that were using the mechanism of GDPR, Article 15, um, all the way through to 22, you know, all of those to say, right, I want to be forgotten, right, I've had enough of you, this is it. And certainly um, when I was DPO for, um, we had... Um, millions of consumers, um, a, a very big e-commerce engine, and certainly um, all of the complaints that were upheld by the regulator that then resulted in a subsequent investigation, or certainly internally my team had to go out and investigate what went wrong. But by and large, the majority of those incidents boiled down to one single thing, and that was a customer was annoyed. Uh, and we never dealt with the, with the underlying cause of that annoyance. And that's why it gets escalated and, and, and often. So I don't know if that helped, but that's certainly um, no. what I see. It, it really does. And, and maybe this is a good, um, and, and we have some questions that are coming in. We're going to spend just a minute more and then turn to the questions uh, for a moment. But, you know, Steve, to your point, I'm going to show two quick slides. CCPA has one particular requirement that everybody who's much more GDR, GDPR focused should just be aware of. And this is this requirement around do not sell. And what do not sell, there's actual technical things you have to do that are analogous to GDPR. And we have, we have spent a lot of time automating this infrastructure for companies. But this is important the first thing you need to be able to do is um you have to give notice to every consumer in the right way in a consumable way if you are selling data and exactly as is the case steve and you've dealt with this under gdpr yeah. sale means much more than what you think it means right <laughs> there it's yeah. almost it's almost any use of the data other than for the clear specific purpose for which is it, it's intended is probably a sale. And so there are a lot of uses of the data that are qualify as a sale. And so a lot of the ways that we're implementing this with customers is we've built out a simple way that says, we don't sell your data in the way that one normally uses the word, 
but there are things we may be doing to improve our products or use it for legitimate purposes that might qualify as a sale, and here's all of the things we do, okay? That's number one. Number two, you need a really, really easy way on almost all of your public-facing properties for somebody to tell you, I want you to not sell my data. And we have engineered something that helps with that, but there's a lot of ways to tackle that. Number three, you need to be able to capture that information that you normally would capture about that person from observable data. You also may need to capture other metadata, like their name and email address, and put that in something called a suppression list. And a suppression list is a place that anybody in the company that needs to can go to, to understand that you've captured the do not sell request. And finally, you need a way to operationalize that your marketing, sales, and your other teams are able to, to, to consult that suppression list when they need to, when they're doing their job. So. We're not going to go deeply into this, but there are there's technology and there's judgment that comes to bear on this. Mm. And we see it the same in the level of automation around an access request. And that comes to one of the questions we received, uh, Steve, which is, you know, uh, when you're when we are dealing and automating subject access requests, so access to data or deletion of data. Um, we see um, we see in the U.S. a lot of as, as I mentioned is consumer based. It sounds like in GDPR you're seeing both consumers and employees, and I, I yeah. get that. Yeah. We're seeing higher volumes than we anticipated in the U.S., and uh, we're seeing higher costs per request. These are two things. But mm -hmm. one of the questions we received was if you're a if you're effectively a controller, a business that received the data, mm -hmm. and you've transferred the data to a service provider, how do you deal with the validation step, like making sure that the person who's making the request is the right person? We've done a fair of this from the technological side. Stephen, do you have insights on this under GDPR? Well, well, certainly um, this is the whole data processor, data controller um, relationship. And, you know, like with any, any um, relationship it comes down to a contractual obligations um and you know so i can't give a short answer to that unfortunately but i think it is fair to say that you would um you would expect and you would hope that that third party um uh, data processor that's processing the data on your behalf will 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 still fulfill the obligations of verification. Now, there may be different circumstances or nuances of where that might change or that, you know, there might be an additional third party. But um, at the end of the day, certainly from a GDPR perspective, the interesting thing about all of this is that, you know, whether you are a, a uh, the, the controller and the um, data processor uh, or even joint controllers, the liability still, um, from GDPR perspective, still stands. So if you were to have a breach or an incident and there was subsequent uh, regulatory action and fines imposed, then you would still be jointly liable, irrespective of whether you are the data processor or the, or the data controller. And so that's an important distinction just to make out there. But it does, it's certainly... Um, in my experience, and, and as, as far as I'm concerned, that you would expect that the processor would have exactly the same obligations as the controller. Yeah, and, and uh, from the CCPA side, uh, Steve, I'd, I'd make a couple of different points. From the technology perspective, what we bring to bear for our customers is built in completely automated uh, technology that a company can switch on or off depending on the business risk to validate uh, that Justin is who Justin is. So, yeah. for example, we have partnered with a company called Ideology and built into our platform that a privacy team can literally switch on 
is the ability to do an ID check or a passport mm -hmm. check. The mm -hmm. data is sensitive. You see this in financial institutions, insurance companies. We have customers, you know, ISPs. You need to really make sure that you know who Justin is, and we can switch on an ID check if the data is sensitive. We've partnered with a company called Axiom, one of the leaders in the privacy space um, and the, uh, the marketing space to do knowledge-based questions. If it's a very sensitive use case, you can switch that on or off. Um, we actually have a full integration with a company called Big ID. They're in the data discovery space. So yeah. if you've done data discovery using a tool like Calibra or Informatica or Big ID, Wirewheel can integrate with those tools so that you can really automate a full DSAR, you know, so that when a subject request comes in, fewer people are having to look for the data in every system. And so we're really looking at the ways that we can leverage tools that your company has already bought, you know, so that you're not, you know, getting a higher R return on those things and then be able to automate these subject rights requests in a way that takes less time. But on the ID side, the ability to check an ID, the ability to do knowledge-based questions, the ability to do an affidavit, the ability to check that the, they have access to the email, these are all critical steps right now in really automating a subject access request. Um, so, uh, you know, we're down to, I think, 10 minutes or so we, you know, we together, uh, I guess I'm going to highlight one thing and then I'll turn it over to, um, to uh, Tom to ask a few questions. Um, we, have, we have two or three resources that are available to folks who join today. One is we have a, um, an entire set of requirements that we've documented that we have made available to the community so that you have a roadmap of the kinds of questions you might wanna ask around technology. And, and that, that link is up on the screen for everybody. It's the key questions for a privacy platform. And we built it in a very detailed technical way. So please feel free to visit and download that if you'd like a deeper, almost RFP level set of requirements uh, for the community. And then we've set up a site for folks on to, uh, to get advice from Steve or to work with our platform to sign up for a demo. And we are partnering with Steve on helping to stand up the privacy programs or implement DSARs. So feel free to reach out um, and schedule time with our teams uh, or reach out to Steve and I through those links. Um, and we do have quite a few questions coming in. Uh, we do have more CCPA slides, which we can make available to anybody as well on the call. Um, but maybe I could turn it over to Tom to start working through the questions we've received. For sure. And thank you guys for the presentation and discussion there. Judging by the questions, it seems like the content was very well received. And uh, I'll kick things off with a question from Steve Bond, who says, how would you look to embed privacy by design in a large siloed institution where there are many chiefs? <laughs> you want to start with that one, Steve? And then we'll... <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a great question. <laughs> um, well, you know, what, one, you know, watch this space. There might not be so many chiefs soon. Uh, <laughs> um, I think this is the million dollar question, Steve. Thank you for that um, question. It's a very good one because, um, it, it, you know, having worked uh, and, you know, a couple of my clients are banks, um, it can be literally as if you've got very siloed, um, almost separate entities within within a bank, you know, like wealth management, et cetera. Um, asset management. So, so they each have very different cultures. And the only thing that I would say is, um, which, you know, going back to my PwC days, um, I would say that you, you need to map, you need to map out um, almost from a stakeholder map type of thing. If you've not done one of those before, you, you, you I, I will take that offline and explain how it's done. And the reason why that is because you know um, the the fantastic solution that that um, Justin's been presenting um, with the Wirewall product is 
is, is a key component of what needs to be done. But just going back to the sort of hearts and minds and the culture of it, that's really where if you get that bit right, then then you, you you're going to make your your whole journey, the implementation of of, of data privacy um, impact assessment processes, much more um, easier to embed. And I think the the key roles within each of those divisions or departments or, or silos. Um, you've got to identify, and you, and, you, and you have to sort of tackle them and, and, and try to get them on side to, so that they understand what you're trying to do. And the only thing I would say, and I'm conscious of the time, is that, look, this, you know, CCPA, uh, GDPR, is a value proposition. It's good for marketeers. It's good for your business. You know, data is the lifeblood of all businesses now, and that, that's increasingly going to be... Um, you know, in this competitive environment, we're going to find ourselves in some pretty economic challenging conditions post-COVID. Um, so, so for me, it will be about seeing how you can demonstrate the value by handling the data in a legal and ethical and more compliant way. And so you can, you can add that value and, and display that through trust with your customers, through your consumers, through the end users ultimately. But I, I'm conscious that was a big question, so I've, I've tried to shorten that. Back, back to you, um, Tom, and uh, unless Justin wanted to add to that. No, the, the, the only technological thing, I, I completely agree with Steve, the technological piece we have brought to bear around privacy by design is to make it a self-service place yeah. where Good. it's really easy to get to. So we, we enable something called a center of excellence for our customers so that a privacy office can stand up a self-service place Brilliant. where a, an individual can get can launch a privacy by design exercise, a privacy impact assessment, where we can add you to the Article 30 process with a record of processing. And we can automate those processes in a nice branded way quickly so that you can stand up something so that a team member can come click on a button and get a privacy by design exercise and then start engaging with your privacy team automatically. So our system self-serves a privacy by design exercise and then alerts your team so that you can call them and start getting involved earlier. So this kind of self-automation ends up driving a fair amount, but it's hard to do. Okay, thank you both. And another question here from Anthony Vita. Do businesses need to coordinate with service providers during the validation step of a consumer's individual rights request? Yeah, and, and I think, Tom, this is the question that Steve and I answered a few minutes ago. We really do, what we've seen, I think GDPR, you're almost mutually responsible in some yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. CCPA, I think, as long as the controller has validated that they are who they are, under CCPA, what we're watching is that the processors are delivering the data back to the controller, and the controller is the one that's turning it over to the consumer. And um, so I think it's, it's much more falling under CCPA to the controller than it is to the processor for now. Okay, and another here from Ron. Do many consumer products companies outsource both the collection and evaluation of PII? And if so, is it clear that the consumer products company has no obligation under GDPR or CCPA? <laughs> Well, <laughs> so may I? <laughs> yeah, um, no, please. Yeah, well, uh, you, you'll have, uh, I'm sure, some, some fantastic input on this. But, you know, you depending on the scope is the big question there. You know, um, what you're doing with the data, what, de you know, the, <clears throat> the attributes of the data, if you like, um, for for the US side and uh, for CCPA. And then, you know, under GDPR, it's incredibly difficult for any um, uh, organization, whether consumer facing or not, not to be under the obligations of GDPR. That's the, you know, the danger of GDPR is, is that the, the territorial scope far goes far beyond the continent of Europe. Um, so 
it, it, it's, it's a difficult one to to give a straight yay nay. Um, but it's all down to the scope and the attributes of the of the data you're using, collecting, selling, etc. Yeah, and, I, and I, I, what I've seen is, you know, there are more companies using third-party services to help manage the collection of their, you know, customer data. You know, m you might be using a CRM, you know, like a Salesforce. You might be managing it on a marketing platform. But ultimately, I think it's the responsibility of the controller to understand what data you're collecting and how you're using it. So I do think it's a little bit hard to answer, you know, totally broadly. We we have integrations into a lot of the major marketing and, and sales platforms so we can model the kind of PII and help with classification quickly if that's an interest. Um, and we have got received a couple of questions asking for the presentation, which we're more than happy, uh, Steve and I are more than happy to set, to send. If you can send a request to info at wirewheel.io, info at wirewheel.io, we'll send you the deeper guidance on the CCPA front as well. Tom, back to you. Okay, I think we've got time for one more question here. We'll squeeze one in and I'll try not to make it too legalese. Um, question here from... Paula, if, if a company is not bank insurance sectors, how would you store such highly sensitive data like passports to authenticate a data subject? This is a great question. Steve, do you mind if I take this one? Because yeah, we yeah, worry yeah. about it. Well, <laughs> okay. So uh, we have spent a tremendous amount of time on how do you balance the privacy interests, the security around validating a subject rights request when you're delivering data back to a person. And the, the two or three takeaways we'd, we'd cover are as follows. First, on our platform, when we take information like an ID or you know, get information for purposes of uh, a knowledge-based validation, uh, neither ourselves nor the services we use to validate keep those IDs. There's a check conducted, the ID is taken away, and then the main confirmation that remains for our customers is just that it was validated or not validated. And that's an important step because it means that our customers now are not burdened with being a controller for IDs and knowledge-based questions. Like you don't wanna increase your risk in this process. So we've spent a lot of time on making sure that the information is collected, that it, it's, it's um, then discarded, and that the information that goes back for fulfillment is merely whether the, the data was valid or not. So that's critical. The second thing we've really seen is insurance companies, financial institutions have sensitive data, but when you look at the marketing data, the observed data, and others that your company might have access to in the aggregate, and you look at it together, you may have a more sensitive view of your customers than you realize. And we've had that with multiple of our, of our companies. And so if you end up having an overall view of your customer based on observable data, data you've purchased, and it ends up communicating a fair amount about your customers or others, you really might want to spend more time validating who they are before you turn that back to a, a requester. So it just comes down to really understanding the risk inherent in the data you're turning over and making sure that the validation and authentication of the requester matches the risk. Okay, thank you very much. And I'd like to thank our audience for joining us today. Unfortunately, we are out of time, but it's been a great discussion between these two. And thank you to Steve and Justin for the presentation today. My pleasure. Tom, thanks for having us. Uh, and Steve, really enjoyed it. I hope yeah, uh, folks yes, enjoyed it. Too. Thank From you. From my perspective, you I really much, hope. Um, Justin, always, always good and, and fantastic interaction. 
Um, and um, I, I, I enjoy these opportunities to, you know, share thoughts, approaches, and uh, technology approaches. Um, so thank you for inviting me. Yeah, no, Steve, I really enjoyed it. And for the entire community on, I really hope everybody is safe at this tough time. And, uh, you know, I know there'll be a lot of challenges coming our way. If uh, Steve and I can help in any way, please let us know. Yes, definitely. Okay. Tom, thank you for hosting today. Thanks, Tom. All right, guys, that's a wrap. The recording's complete. So uh, we're done. Thank you both. Thanks, Tom. And Steve, just thank so you. you. Know, just so you know, the, the presentation will be available to view on demand for all who weren't able today. And we'll be sending you the recording uh, via WeTransfer. Terrific. We had a lot of other questions as well. Is there a way for our team to get and follow up with these folks? Absolutely. Yeah. I'll send the Q&A report um, via email to uh, Gohar and yourself.